if you are a first time visitor, if you will uh, look at the pew rack, you'll see it's changed colors, a yellow card, it may be green, it may be yellow, it used to be green, now it's yellow. If you're a first time visitor, if you would take the yellow guest card and fill that out, we'd like to have more information about you, and put, just put that in the offering plate. At this time, I'd like to ask you to take a few moments to say hello to those, those around.
grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Let's stand together as we sing.
show me. Of course, I was astounded. I didn't feel bad. didn't have any particular hurts. didn't have any difficulties going on. When he gave me the information, he showed it to me. He said, now you have three good, clear options. You can do this procedure, or you can do that procedure, or you can wait and see. He said, but I'm not going to let you out of my office until you make the right decision. I said, well, is there a wrong decision? Yes. Wait and see is a wrong decision. Because you will have full-blown death in your pathway. You can do this procedure, or you can do this procedure. It's your decision. But I'm not going to let you wait and see. Because the obvious results will kill you. You know, it's interesting. As we face tough decisions, we have to decide what's really important. We've got to go back to the garden and walk around in there and say, Lord, have you already told us exactly some things that we have not heard or not understood or not perceived? Talk to us. Some of us may be saying, I heard you knocking on the top of this. <clears throat> we need to find out what it is God has called us people to do in the these are changing times, and they're unsettling times, and sometimes they can be very confusing times. For the church today, when you look through our congregation and you don't see that the congregation, I mean, that the, the pews in this church are absolutely packed full of people who are hungry to know how to have a relationship with God, then you know that we have some important decisions to make. You can make a decision about this procedure, or you can make a decision about this procedure. These decisions are really up to you. But the wait and see decision is one that will offer you a pathway to death. I'm not going to let you make that decision. And so we have decisions that we make every day. Will you serve in a certain place that's vacant? Will you lead us into fresh opportunities that our people are asking for? Will you give sacrificially so that we can accomplish some things that allow us to minister to people? Will you open the doors of this church so that more people can hear the wonder of the saving grace of our Christ? We make decisions every day. But to not decide is to clearly to decide. And so we face important challenges as Christians. We will make some decisions. We have to. Not to make decisions would be to invite certain death. Would you take a minute and let's pray together? Well, Lord, you've called us to live. You've given us everything we need. To live satisfied and full lives. You invite us to reflect your character in what we do. And you've given us some freedom to face the temptations that continue to pick away at us. Oh Lord, show us how to make decisions from what you have already called us to be. And as we do, oh Lord, Help us to become more and more the people that accomplish the tasks that this world so desperately needs. We give you thanks for the leadership of your Holy Spirit. We give you thanks for the forgiving grace of Christ Jesus our Lord. We thank you for the sturdy promises of our Almighty God and Creator. We build our lives on these. We claim we're well informed. Help us now to do the things that are important and help us to be what you want us to be so that we can decide what you want us to do. In Jesus' name. As we close our time in worship, I want to remind you that we're gathering up at the conclusion of service after a time of reading. We're going to
spend a little time together in some thinking and asking questions, and I invite you all to stay for that. But this is a time of decision for us about simple things, about who runs our lives, who's in charge of this congregation, who's in charge of your life. The decision that you've made years ago has guided you to come and worship and to grow as a Christian. If you've never made a decision for Christ, here's an opportunity for you to simply lay your life before the Lord and say, Lord, you can have my life. I want you to live in me, for Christ in me will be the hope of glory. So I invite you to make a decision for Christ, a decision to come and be a part of this church. Let's stand and sing together. Amazing grace, God, sweet as <laughs>
it is your desire to come and serve the Lord here in Western. And Kirsten, it is. Yeah. They uh, have been trying to get their act together and join for several Sundays, and they end up in the nursery, and they end up in different places <laughs> in the church. And they have five people to coordinate, so they, they finally got together this Sunday that they're here to serve. And they're going to be a part of our young adult fellowship, too. And that's a great thing. Would you welcome into the fellowship of this church by their statement of faith and the presentations of their church letters, Weston and Kirsten Hall. Would you join me in welcoming us, uh, welcoming them into our church by saying amen? Amen. And we love you. We love you. <laughs> That's a pledge from a very loving church who wants to encourage you and bless you and, and help you as you raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. So glad to be here. If you'll stay here a little bit after our benediction time, I know folks will want to walk on the feet. And again, this is Pearl who is six, Ren who is five, and Levi who had his third birthday last Sunday. And he'll be the one you can tell who has a fireman's cap on. <laughs> Good to have all of you together. And we have guests with us from Richmond. And we have other guests that I have not had a chance to speak to. Please speak to uh, one another and give a word of encouragement. We never know what sort of challenges any of us will face in this coming week. The encouragement that we give each other will mean a lot. We're glad that you're with us. Let's stand for our time of business. Lord, thank you for the faith that you've placed within us. For the guiding light you've shown to us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. For the simple instruction you've given to us as you've given us all things and all opportunities for the great satisfaction to live in this world in our time. We ask you, O oh Lord, to be with us in power and in mercy and to guide us into a way that is pleasing to you. We're thankful for our church family. We're thankful for this young family who's come to serve you here in this church. We ask that we will be a blessing to them as they will be a blessing to us. Guide us by the grace of Christ Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. And we ask our prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Be strong, be strong.
elements are a part of its decision making. Sometimes we forget. Sometimes we leave it all up to the preacher. Or sometimes we leave it all up to a board, like a business gathering, a board of deacons. Or sometimes we just don't make decisions. Decisions are crucial. And sometimes the process of decision making can be as important and as telling about the church as the decisions that are made. So it's important for us to look at this together, and I want to turn to two or three portions of the book of Genesis and invite your attention to these portions of Scripture. And I ask you, if you would, to stand with me in honor of the reading of the Word. Genesis chapter 2. From the first chapter of Genesis, familiar words, the second chapter, and then the third chapter. I'll read these with you. They're not overhead. Right? <laughs> I haven't gotten myself oriented yet to the overheads and all of that. The first chapter of Genesis at 26 and 27 verses. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air over the livestock and over all the earth, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it, and rule. Second chapter, the 15th verse, then picks it up. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, You're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. From the third chapter, beginning with the first verse, now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that's in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. The eyes of both of them were opened and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. God has blessed the reading of his word through generations of his people gathering together to listen. I think the real question for us is will he bless us because he's found us listening, attentively listening, and grappling with understanding what God is saying to us. Would you bow to me in prayer? Lord, we're thankful that you've seen to our needs. We're thankful that you have cared for us. We're thankful that we not only can read the written word, but we have the living word, even in Christ. And who we have life and have it more than We pray for special people in our church. Those that struggle this morning with health issues and concerns that unnerve them and make their lives difficult. We pray for AC only and for Kathy Carlisle and for Don Jackson and for Rex Cloud and for Ani Ayazwe. We're thankful for faithful service that you have placed in our midst through the years. 
We had the blessing on the Lutheran family and on Captain Burgess's family as they say goodbye and learn how to wrap up the work of good people who love their churches and serve so faithfully. We pray also for those around the world who struggle to know who you are. We ask your blessings on the Pittmans as they serve in Syria and Turkey and all those people and the thousands of refugees who've been sent from their homes to struggle and survive in foreign lands. We pray, Lord, for the peace of these lands and for their people. We pray for the Hannahs as they leave, for Taiwan just in the next few days, and that you would bless those people to whom they minister and the places where they go. They will have fruitful times of service. We pray for the Tarkaskis who are struggling with the uncertainties of the people in Ukraine. We pray for those people. Lord, hear their prayers as they struggle to make their country a country of unity, country of productivity, a country of opportunity. We pray for blessings on all of these people who we care for, but we pray also for ourselves. Because we are people of need. We ask for your help. We ask for your encouragement. And we ask for the forgiveness of our and our sins. For all of these and turn aside in the ways that you have led us in. We cast this that to you in the name of the Lord. We ask that you will be merciful to us, and forgive us, and get us on a path of work. That is it. Christ our Lord, thank you. Listen to the scriptures you hear. Now there were carefully those given in Genesis. You hear that in the name of much. Those who that came in the word that will create. How does that? Their place. Did you also that much were to set on them. They had to what their religion had to do. They had been determined what to do. They had to determine what they were to be proven. They had been they had to be determined their or if they were fruitful, as they all the all couch should be watched in the water state. They were on the couch. It's just making it every day long. Decision to part of every target. Every one of us has a daily as for every mark to let us have a decision. Like, Things that form for granted, we don't even think twice. We take our, you know, personal mind, we don't have any more of the things that God is going to do to put us out on the road and get where we're moving. Again, and yet, we have to recognize that we are the result of all the decisions that we have made. So, and each decision gives us opportunity to make more decisions that define who we want to become. Not to decide is to decide, isn't it? Decide. Decide. Sometimes we're really just not ready for the decisions that some have. The story is told of a lady right here in Mike Mountain who was at home, had not been in church for a while, so the pastor decided to come and pay her a visit. As he came, drove up the driveway, knocked on the door. He could hear some activity back there, but Nobody came to the door, so he carefully wrote out on his card Revelation 3.10, and he left it in the door. The scripture said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And then he left. Well, she was showering, and she hadn't, was not able to get to the door and receive her guests. And so when she finished, she went to the door, and she realized that her guests had left. And so she got the card and realized that it said, Behold, I stand in the door and knock. Revelation 3.10. The next Sunday, she walked up and gave the pastor a card that said, Genesis 3.10. I heard you knocking, but I was naked. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we're not ready for the decisions that come our way. You know that I've been traveling this week in my life in Brunswick, Georgia, and went up to the uh, wonderful courthouse that has some features that were fashioned by uh, Guastavino, the great um, architect or, or the, um, the the maker of the vaults and the tiles and the billboard house and who, whose home was right here in Black Mountain during those years. <clears throat> As we went into that place, I went past a car that recognized that some decisions are very clear and help people put their feet on solid ground. 
There was a late model Buick there. It seemed to be all jacked up and had big chrome wheels on it. And as I went around the front, it had a license plate in the very front of it. And it said, I have everlasting life. John 3.16. But I thought that was pretty brave for a person to be clear about that decision and to make it clear to all those around me. But they tell us today that our young folks have a kind of option overload. There's so many decisions, there's so many opportunities, and so many choices and options that there is a delay of making some of the major decisions of life because there are just too many to sort out. Sort them out. History is formed by the decisions that we make every day. When you turn to the Genesis text, you read the story of creation and you read the story of opportunities that provide for Adam and Eve. But you also read in every line, in every opportunity, there is much responsibility placed on their shoulders to decide how they will respond. But really, there is no decision to be made there, is there? Because the guidelines are clearly laid out. God is the owner of this garden. They're given the opportunity to come and be there. And they have the opportunity to do exactly what God has instructed them to do. And so there are really no decisions until an, a tempter comes and says, did God really mean what he said? Or did he really say that at all? Are you sure enough about yourself that you heard what you think you heard? And are you sure that God is trustworthy enough to really mean what God was perceived to have said. And suddenly decision making became critical. Because they made, they were to make choices about, first of all, whether they were going to stay in the garden and do clearly what had been given them to do, or whether they were going to do what they decided. So decision-making was kicked up to a whole nother level. And you read these three texts that I read to you, essentially it kind of reads like a progression. It clarifies that when God created man and woman, and cre he created them with his own image in them. Meaning that in his, in his image that they bear the very character of God, and they know who God is. The image was placed upon them. And then the Lord gives the garden to them. And the place belongs to God. And he invites them in and gives it all to them and gives them opportunity for everything except for one, which the Lord claims for himself and says, you have everything else here, but not this one. And then the last text, that third chapter, said that suddenly there is a challenge to what has been said to be true. Can you trust that? And can you trust yourselves to perceive what you think you heard? And so there's a challenge to the purpose of being placed in the garden and given the gifts of these opportunities. And that sets up the decision-making process. Not too many weeks ago, there was a report <clears throat> on um, uh, this church transitioning. We heard the wonderful scripture, Micah 6, 6. And what does the Lord require of him? He has shown you, old man, what he requires of him. To, to love mercy, to do justice, and to walk humbly with faith in God. And there's an affirmation that we clearly have been told that Adam and Eve were told in the garden. This that there are the boundaries there are in this opportunity there has been given the boundaries and there's a way to do it. What do we go about it? Do you think but maybe we really think that the decision we make we face so requires going through the matrix that part scripture the how to work the heart of mercy by the side. Let's see. I decided to say, well, I see how I have mercy so they want to work justly. Let's see. Fair, I decided to choose black justly in the way of this opportunity that I have. In, in right, I have other people. I walk. 
Oh, I'm more. What about humility, my little time with God? That's how I've done my job. Now I can warn him to go to, I'll put that high and high. Now that I need to go out of here as I proceed. Yes, it does. Need to do. right. Going to the text of what does require. Uh, but to through the main text. But my does require. It's supposed to be true. I'll say that for that. It, this is the part that is by which we call for line uh, filtered by us to be all in me. That's what God with that is called to me is given to the book. Given us for star opportunities and to have set up some keys given to us that we can do and call us to the boundary. I wish we the goal is called challenge. Very interesting challenge. Garden talk in this challenge. Very interesting. <clears throat> they are in that chapter replacing the, the, the ownership of God. Replacing the sense of us. The and in the garden set up and how does that not get them is oh no that's not the way the chapter you're not gonna just get to know that you're the owners you're not you can do exactly what they want to do the whispering of you is the thing that we're all with oh you know something it's really not that important don't deny all the things that are so hard to do. They're so tough and challenging and they require some now why can you do nothing but those things? You'll find some other ways to get around it. The whisper of still guesses for us today. Did God really mean what he said? Possibility of having it all was introduced by the tempter. And the question for all of our decision making had to do with do we know what God wants? And is it as important as what we discern that we want? You know, see, our decisions define us. Every little decision we make, you had to make some simple decisions about whether you were going to dress a certain way. Not too many weeks ago, I asked you, none of you wear ties. Ron Spring lost his nerve. Nobody else had a tie on this whole church, but Ron Spring had a tie. <laughs> and sometimes we face decisions and we aren't certain about exactly what the, the preacher meant, what he said. We make a decision about a path to Asheville. Will we go on Old 70, a little more scenic, a little more peaceful ride? A few stoplights, of course, along the way, but it's just about the same, maybe a little longer. Will we go Highway 70 into Asheville? Or will we take the interstate and get there quicker? Or will we even go at all? Ethicists tell us that there's a clear distinction going on. Some decisions just are about measurements. Which one is quicker? Which one gets us there faster? Which one is shortest distance and so on. Which one is more and so on. But the other decisions are value decisions. And those value decisions are the ones that define us. We make decisions about whether we're going to wear a tie or not, or whether we're even going to go to church or not. It's really not a big deal whether you wear a tie or not. I lost my nerve right after I saw Ron, and I said, I wish I had worn a tie. <laughs> but that's just a measurement. But a values decision is different. And that is, will I come to church at all? Will I make a decision to be a part of a church at all? That's a values decision, and a values decision defines who we are. The opportunity that Adam and Eve had in their day is an opportunity we have that still exists for us. And that is that we can make decisions according to who we already are, rather than making a decision that will later shape us and define us. We can make a decision based on what, who we already are. All of us make decisions from life principles. And the three life principles that come out of these Genesis texts are simple. One is we know the character of God. It's been stamped on us. We are called to reflect the character of God in our living. That's a life principle for us. That affects our decision making. Second of all, we've been given everything we need. We've been given the opportunity to walk into the garden of Adam and Eve where we've been given the blessings of this life. Things that will satisfy us with good work and provide plenty of joy and give us opportunities to be fruitful and multiply. We've been given these opportunities. Get busy. 
And then thirdly, we've been called to live within the boundaries that God has given us. Good decisions are not made for our comfort. Good decisions are made from our convictions. We make decisions from whom we have already become. Good decisions are not made about what we want. As Christians, we make decisions according to what we believe. And we make decisions about what is right. We make decisions about what is best. And it all comes from what is true. So we make decisions according to what is true. How do we discern then the will of God? How do we make decisions based on the will of God? The image of God in us has given us the opportunity to think perceive what's going on around us and to respond in the character of God. We've been given the opportunity to resist temptation. We've even give, been given the power of Christ in our lives to recognize and resist temptation. We make decisions by thinking and responding and reasoning and discerning out of the image of God which has been stamped on each of us. And then the gifts of the garden are ours. You know, apple picking is something that's really famous in Western North Carolina. You can go out there and pick apples. Adam and Eve would go crazy over the opportunity we have, wouldn't they? We've been given opportunities to walk into a, uh, a wonderful place out on the side of a mountain, and we can pick sweet ones or tart ones. We can pick we can pick fat ones or small ones, or crunchy ones or soft ones. We have to decide, and we decide on what we are planning to do. Those it might just be the daily dose. My grandfather always believed in an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And he was a doctor. He was hoping he'd have less work. He had one of those cranky and uh, peelers and cores of an apple. You would stick it on the fingers of that apple core, and as you turned it, it would spin that apple around a blade and peel the entire peeling off. And then you would do one last move and it would pop out the core, cut right through the core. And you'd have a peeled apple in your hand. And my grandfather believed in it so much so that he gave me his apple core and reminded me an apple a day will keep the doctor away. It was confusing to me as a five year old. I wanted my grandfather. <laughs> but we decide the purpose for those apples, don't we? If it's not a daily dose, it might be fried apples with good Virginia country ham. Or it might be apple dumplings for dessert. But there are always pies and pastries and fritters. Adam and Eve would just be crazy over the options. And maybe we have option overload. But we decide. But when we come to the big decisions of life, we have to ask, what does God want us to to be. <coughs> and out of that will come the decision about what, what we will do. What does God want us to be? It's not an easy decision. It does not come quickly. It doesn't come overnight. It's not automatic. <coughs> no matter how strong our opinions might be, our opinions have to be informed by the good facts. Uh, the decisions that we make will be decisions. And the decisions that we make will shape our future. One, what does God call us to be? What, is, what does He call us to be? He asks us to do in our lives. My scriptures and the cross clear to set firm. The boundaries are set up for us. To love to do justice. To walk to justice. And the answer is critical. But that decision answers the critic about questions of decisions that have to be made about what's available and what's right and for us. And so much of the challenge among us for us is not so a right for us to decision we will be opinion from. Challenge there are is what is the that. There are no easy Answers for In scripture, easy answer for us. Adam and Eve. 
at this point, but after this, at the very point, we have not first be us clear about what laws we can make and be nation. Take the risk and then make time to decide and tell about what this is making. God's based decision people that everyone that they made. History is by the decision. And his original form, this is an important area that cannot be likely. It's if we take a decision and we require gathering as much information as you can about gas and information on your needs. Okay? And to study the scriptures, to hear the reprinting of grief, is what scriptures in your heart is out. And then proceed to take this and to hear it. Everything begins with the prayer. Everything, everything in prayer. Everything begins with saying, God, what do you ever want us to be? From there, we decide what shall we do.